Okay, so I hope uh, both um, sound and vision are okay uh, for everyone. So welcome everyone to this parallel session um, in this year's Alzheimer's Europe um, conference. This is session P3. Uh, I'm Carlos Diaz, I'm CEO of um, Synapse Research, a small and medium um, company located in Spain. And I'm the coordinator of the Neuronet uh, project within IMI. Um, we will have a number of sessions as you have seen in the program probably uh, that are sponsored by, by Neuronet and we will be attacking different topics of interest um, and topics that we're actually dealing with uh, within Neuronet. So this first parallel session um, is entitled Efficient Data Sharing, a must for science to respond to societal needs. Um, I think just by way of introduction that um, invariably uh, we're seeing data sharing as one of the key topics in um, all of the strategic documents regarding Alzheimer's and regarding dementia and how to progress in this area. Um, I think that there is a, um, a very obvious need to actually uh, share more data, share better data, uh, promote the reuse of data as well. Uh, you can see that as a priority in the Lausanne meeting documents. You can see that in IMI, you can see it, uh, as I said, in every um, strategic document that, that comes um, out there. So um, obviously we, we all know that this is a multifactorial problem, uh, data sharing. Um, there's uh, technical issues, um, perhaps the less important nowadays. Um, there's also um, uh, legal issues. There's also financial issues with, with data sharing, ethical issues, of course. Um, and there's also a, a social um, psychological component as well, affecting data sharing, how much data are shared, uh, for what purpose, etc. So uh, I think we have an excellent panel today. Uh, and I'm very glad to see that we cover um, all of the key aspects perhaps pertaining to data sharing from data discovery. So the, um, the way of detecting the presence of data, the existence of data, where data are located, uh, who sits on top of the data, uh, what mechanisms there are for accessing data, um, to uh, harmonization, standardization, which is, which is obviously a key problem as well so that, so that the uh, data can be analyzed um, in an homogeneous way to analysis. Um, and we will be benefiting from the experience of um, the EPAD project, for example, in terms of, of analysis. Um, and at the end of the session, we'll also have a presentation uh, about Neuronet itself and what we're doing in terms of trying to share best practice um, for, um, for data sharing. So um, I, we're also spanning with our speakers a number of types of institutions from academia to SMEs, to uh, Big Pharma. So I think this is gonna be a very interesting um, session and certainly one of the key problems we have to face in the next uh, years, in the next decade at most, if you want to really make progress. So uh, without further ado, I will introduce now the first, our first speaker. I will, I will ask all speakers to please stick to uh, the 10, 12 minutes allotted uh, for, uh, for presentations because we want to have also space um, for uh, questions and answers at the end. So our first speaker, Nigel Hughes uh, from uh, Janssen. Nigel has a, a 35 year career um, spanning the NHS in the UK, NGOs, patient organizations, and also of course, uh, pharmaceutical industry, uh, worked clinically in HIV, viral hepatitis, liver disease, uh, liver disease and in sales and marketing, medical affairs, market access, health economics, um, R&D, you know, uh, you name it. Yeah, I mean, everything, everything, health IT, real world data and real world evidence perhaps uh, more recently. His, his experience covers clinical education um, as an advisor, consulting communications and lobbying over the years. Um, he's currently, and this is uh, perhaps the most important uh, point for today's uh, presentation, he's currently the project lead for an MI2 project called EDEN, um, a European health data and evidence network. Um, and of course was platform co-lead for the previous EMIF project um, as well as consulting on numerous projects and programs in the domain of real world data, real world evidence. So uh, with that, uh, Nigel, I hope that the presentation was okay. Uh, a very rich uh, profile. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Carlos. And I sincerely hope uh, you can see uh, the uh, slide cover on the screen as well. Make sure that's working. Um, so um, I do want to uh, thank uh, the organizers and Neuronet uh, and uh, Alzheimer's Europe for uh, inviting me to speak today and Carlos for your warm uh, words to begin with. And uh, my, uh, I need to set the scene, I suppose, with this session. I will talk a lot about 
harmonization of health data, but I'll look at some of the uh, aspects related to that. Also some uh, historical and current examples, both in Alzheimer's and in multiple sclerosis. And then I'll, uh, I'll come out with some, some key points at the end. So without further ado, and because time is, is pressing, um, some of you may have seen this cartoon. Uh, I'm worried that healthcare has become too impersonal, Doc. Nonsense, just relax and lie back on the barcode scanner. But um, in essence, in some respects, despite everything we'd say related to uh, governance and, and, and socio versus just technical aspects of, of working with, with health data, real world data, observational data and so on, uh, we are increasingly seeing the, the rise and the need for, for many different stakeholders uh, for the utilization of phenomic data, but phenotypic, incorporating also genotypic uh, sequence data and so forth to help us characterize uh, disease, biological targets and so forth, progression of disease, treatment response, all those kind of things um, increasingly. What we are clearly very keen to do and need to do is protect and preserve the, uh, the, uh, the rights of a citizen in particular for their their, uh, their private information, confidentiality, and so on. And, and for the most part, I think certainly in terms of medical research, there's of no interest to us. And in fact, an individual outside of a rare disease, probably uh, individual data is, is of little consequence, but, but large scale uh, cohorts of data, if you like, or groups of individual data uh, without the need to understand identity, of course, are increasingly important. Um, so, so data harmonization as a concept is, is socio-technical. So on the technical side, many of you are probably in this session are familiar with FAIR, but it's you know, data findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And this is now an overarching paradigm, I think, in terms of looking at uh, data, in particular uh, real world or observational data. Um, is it structured? And most of what we're working with today has to, traditionally been structured so within, for instance, medical records and so on. But increasingly, of course, you know, working with unstructured or semi-structured data or both, uh, metadata describing that data and so forth has become uh, significantly expansive with, with newer technologies over the years to help us do this. And it's important because actually structured data, for instance, in medical records, probably only has a small percentage of, of all the insightful, interesting information that we're looking for in different disciplines, different disease areas and so, and so forth. Can we get agreement on uniform data representation? You know, is it local data? Is it federated, i.e. data stays local, but you can interact with it in a distributed, federated manner, or both? Uh, are we using things like common data models uh, to, to assist with interoperability and harmonization of data? Talk a little bit more about that later. Um, minimal viable data sets, particularly linked to you know, years of experience and working with things like registries, of course, as well, standardized vocabularies, semantic and syntactic interoperability. And also, uh, do we have consistency even in the, uh, the mapping of data and the curation of data and ETL, extract, transform and location of data and the validation and veracity of, of this data at, at large scale? Is it fit for purpose? Can we answer queries effectively? And quite often, too often, actually, uh, we may not even characterize our questions well enough and we look for the, the answer in the data we have, uh, which leads to all sorts of issues, of course, as well. Um, are there standardized analytics and tools that we can work with? Uh, for instance, in the Odyssey community, OHTSI, Observational Health Data Sciences Informatics uh, International Collaboration, uh, where there are uh, common data models like OMOP, standardized analytical tools. Uh, there are other uh, models for this as well, Sentinel for the FDA, uh, for instance, as well, other commercial models as well uh, that fit into this category. Uh, can we evaluate, well, I'll loosely term this quality, but can we characterize data? Can we understand the nuances of that data? It's missingness or versus completeness, for instance, and comprehensiveness and, and so on. How often is it refreshed? And how is all this maintained? Actually, you know, it's usually not a fire and forget exercise in working with, with data and particularly harmonizing it, because data will change over time. It will need refreshing. If you use things like common data models and other approaches, they also will evolve over time. So that they, you know, if you're going to do this, it's, a, it's in, you're in for a long haul. And quite often it's quite a long tail effect as well in terms of what data you're harmonizing over time. But also it's socio-technical. So on the socio side, you know, do you have a collaboration in place? Is there a common aim, a quid pro quo for doing all this work? Are there agreements in place? Um, this can take a month of Sundays, of course, it can take even longer than some of the technical aspects in terms of administering this. 
how is it governed? What kind of oversight uh, are there ethical aspects in terms of use of data, particularly increasingly phenomic data, which would include genomic or indeed other omic data that is of, of higher even sensitivity in, in multidimensional data. Um, regulatory requirements, clearly GDPR and e-privacy and so forth, um, but, but other local and institutional requirements of an ethical or other level. Um, and transparency, is there end-to-end -end transparency and what is the process, is open to scrutiny? Can you understand the source data and, and where you get to in terms of data curation or harmonization by a common data model? Um, busy slide again, we'll get less busy I hope, as time goes on, but you know, that was fairly generic, I think, across uh, all of the um, uh, all of these um, various areas, but actually neurodegenerative disease, neurological disease, there may be special considerations around harmonizing cohorts versus data, multidimensional data I've mentioned, the particular drugs, imaging, cognitive scores, patient reported outcomes and so on. And all of those aspects already mentioned in terms of the challenges in terms of what we are asking and is this all uh, fit for purpose and so forth. But what about also longitudinal and temporal relationships for long chronic uh, diseases and there's a consensus over this. And do we have consistency from everything from our assumptions uh, around the data and the question to the assumptions on say mapping to a common data model, harmonizing this data and so on and working with low hanging fruit from structured to semi-structured data and, and then that long tail strategy that I mentioned. Um, historically, there's been, uh, for instance, EMIF-AD, European Medical Information Framework, Alzheimer's Disease subproject that ran through from 2013 to 2018 and created cohorts like the EMIF-1000, which was uh, actually more of a traditional approach using, uh, in this case, Transmark as a data repository, incorporating all sorts of uh, uh, phenotypic data, but also multiple omics data in high, high dimensional fashion. For, for evaluating and then doing further research on biomarker discovery in, in, in Alzheimer's cohorts at scale, and I think quite successfully within that project, resulting in further work around things like a catalog, which fits in with FAIR, findable, accessible, and so on, um, which, is, uh, which was available from the project uh, more extensively and, wide, and widely for anyone working in this type of research to understand what kind of data is out there and, and, and metadata on it and characteristics. You can see some of the characteristics of the time a few years ago now in all the types of cohorts that were included and so forth and, and how well used this catalog was and the geographical distribution and so on. And in fact, actually developing a harmonization process based loosely around the own common data model with 150 agreed variables uh, resulting in a harmonization approach that could, could be used to support uh, parts of selection tools, variable selection tools, and then conducting research in a remote research environment. And as Carlos and some of you already know, we ran out of time, basically. Uh, and unfortunately, this uh, was a missed opportunity, I think, particularly in terms of linkage with GAIN, Dimensions Platform UK. We'll hear about EPAD from Rodrigo, which is very much looking forward to. All of these you know, could have been interesting in terms of linkage to a very large scale European approach to, uh, to, to, to responding to, to, uh, to Alzheimer's, which it needs. Meanwhile, if you look more recently, if you look at Multiple Sclerosis Data Alliance, where they are scaling up using a federated approach with international registries and cohorts with multiple sclerosis to respond to this long time interval where you get disease progression, which is actually accelerating faster than actually the opportunity to do research and even do a publication, which is not right, certainly not in the 21st century. So a, a whole number of years have been taken to create a collaboration, which is now called the MS Data Alliance. Um, there's a core data set that's been created more recently this year because of COVID-19. And actually, like many disease areas, people, patients, citizens were saying, I'm worried about COVID-19. What are my risks? Am I more susceptible? Do the treatments I take uh, produce a more susceptibility of risk and or disease or worse outcomes and so on? And so very laudable and commendable, the MS Data Alliance created a very rapid response this year and really weeks and months to accelerate uh, the incorporation of um, international data into a common data set to interrogate that and answer these types of questions which are now in publications and created quite a uh, complex but, uh, but, but working model for, for data sharing based on the Cumenta platform. Unfortunately, only for COVID-19, this is not going to be ongoing and there are governance aspects and so forth which are, are impacting on this, but it shows, and COVID-19 is doing this, I think, as a pandemic, it, it can accelerate some of the things that has formerly taken us months, if not years or even longer. 
very brief mention about European Health Data and Evidence Network, which kind of brings all this together in terms of harmonization, federation of uh, networks, uh, community and open science, community development, education, and focus on outcome generation and impacting on, on, on real world practice today, and not in several tomorrows in any disease area, it's agnostic, a very large scale project. But one of the key challenges we all face is that we are always having to cat herd. These are seven of my 10 cats or our 10 cats at home. My wife is an excellent cat herder on a Sunday afternoon, um, grooming them. Um, but so cats can be herded, but it can feel like that in doing all of this work, technically and socially as well. And lastly, I think we're all cognizant of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think this is just as applicable to neurological diseases as, as many other diseases, if not all, the right data and the right place to answer the right question. It's taken us years to get to this point, but in certain domains we are certainly moving more rapidly. Federated networks, or networks in general are expanding internationally, I think responding to the need for data, coalescing not just the data, but researchers and expediting more rapid research because we need answers today, if not yesterday, and not in several tomorrows. And I think the complexity of neurogenetic diseases surely necessitates international if not global collaboration based around data harmonization, but research harmonization and governance harmonization and so on to address the needs of patients and to improve outcomes. And thank you for the time. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Carlos. Thank you very much, uh, Nigel. Again, <clears throat> we'll take questions at the end uh, after all presentations have been delivered. So next up is uh, Rodrigo Barnes uh, from Aridia Informatics. Uh, Rodrigo is a Chief Technology Officer at Aridia, where he's leading the development and deployment of the um, Aridia Digital Research Environment. Um, he's an R&D software engineer with a mathematical background and expertise in developing analytical and data management applications in healthcare, life science, and knowledge management startups. So Rodrigo, the floor is yours. Hi, hopefully you can all see my screen. Thanks everyone for the chance to, to kind of tell you a little bit of our, our experience working with EPAD. And um, I wanted to really talk through a number of levels of our experience um, as the EPAD project was our, our first direct effort of working with um, some of the, the kinds of, of uh, partners that, that were in, in the NNIMI program. And I think it's been a really valuable experience for us. And, and, and I want to tell you a little bit about going, how we're going forward with that um, within the, the broader AD community. Um, so in, in summary, I, I will tell you a little bit about you know, the backdrop of this is the work we do around digital research environments, but we really wanted to, to kind of highlight aspects of, of data sharing and, and data management within EPAD as really the backbone of this. And hopefully this will be useful information. Just very quickly, as for those of you who don't know us, we're a small company based in Scotland um, and we, we work doing health data science services for academic medical centers, collaborative data commons, and also pharmaceutical companies who are wanting to use the cloud and data science. And, you know, we have a very straightforward kind of business model, which is being a data processor. And, uh, and, and I think that really helps us deliver services for, for a whole range of customers where we don't really impede on the impinge on the privacy or intellectual property um, of, of the customers. So our, our digital research environment is, um, is a cloud-based platform. And I'm, I'm setting the frame here so that some of what I say later kind of makes sense, um, where organizations like hospitals or pharmaceutical companies or collaborations like EPAD can, can make their data available and discoverable. Um, and then also can, can collaborate internally um, and bring in external collaborators to kind of expand the network. I mean, I think one of the, everyone's mentioning COVID this, this, this afternoon. Um, I mean, the, the reality of working remotely is, is becoming more and more um, obvious. And um, I think we've never been busier really in terms of providing people with, with the kind of um, collaborative environment. But thinking about that at scale as well, and everything we, we kind of do is, is how do you, how do you how do you manage to scale out horizontally across lots of people within organizations and communities? Uh, because if you have, you know, a thousand PhD students at a university hospital using the cloud, you'll have a thousand different kind of governance models. Um, and, and so we, th we think a lot about providing a platform for privacy, uh, consent, use of healthcare data, uh, but also self-service at scale. Um, and we, and, our core services of fair data and collaborative workspaces really feed into 
how our customers want to use that data, which is to develop and host decision support tools. That's ultimately what they want to do. They want to have impact in the, in the clinical workflow or the patient experience. And, and uh, so that's why I like to put two out of those three boxes as things that we do day in, day out. And the third one is what, what we know our customers kind of want to do. Um, a lot of this uh, data sharing does come down to organizational um, aspects. And we've found over the years that um, we started working with what you could call enterprise, you know, single organizations like a hospital where the rules are defined by that organization. And I think one of the things we learned with EPAD was in a, a consortium is more of an opt-in model. So the rules are, are agreed and people opt into using those, re, those rules. What we're finding now is um, those consortia tend to have a short life. We've already heard about, about Eden and EMIF, um, sorry, uh, and, and, and the kind of timeframes, EPAD's the same, you know, that you maybe get initial funding. So what, what we're seeing a lot more of now is, is the kind of funding coming in for ecosystems where you have many to many relationships. So not just one organization, not one, just one set of rules. Um, and I think that's going to be more the future um, where people will, will do their work in amongst other, other projects and consortia. So EPAD, EPAD was a consortium, um, like you can think of it as a pre-competitive consortium where um, the stakeholders, including the IMI and the FPF um, kind of partners wanted to improve the kind of run-in data for clinical trials, um, you know, based on experience of not enough, not enough kind of therapies coming to, through the, through the pipeline. Um, and I think the, the original, I you know, part of the original idea was to, to set a standard and set a foundation for a networked effort to recruit better into clinical trials with better data and integrate with clinics. And I, I think that there's a lot learned from that process. So during that, during the IMI program, Aridia provided um, data management and data curation for the longitudinal cohort. And we also provide and provided workspaces for collaborative an analysis between different groups and um, now onwards for, for data sharing and data use. And, and EPAD's been a really interesting community with, uh, you know, across Europe, lots of partners um, sharing data and, and analysis through the DRE. Just looking at some of the numbers, just to, um, about 2000 participants and lots of data points. I mean, I'm not gonna to drill too much into it, but I think it, what, what's interesting about that is that this is you know, one of a number of assets of data to, uh, that are in the community and it, it's kind of very well characterized. We had to make lots of decisions around um, data models. So, so Nigel mentioned um, the kind of data modeling decisions that people make. Um, we didn't actually choose OMOP as it happens. Um, I'll come back to that at the end. Um, but also semantic interoperability. So we've done some work to try and keep our house in order. We have about 27,000 concepts um, that, that come into play with, with the, the data types that are collected in, in EPAD. And, and, a, and a variety of, um, of data types that, that kind of characterize the, the participant phenotype. Um, this is, I like to put this slide up just to show the, the, how these systems are. And, and I can imagine behind every, behind every EPAD behind every Eden behind all the kind of sites. There is a, probably another circuit diagram like this where data comes from lots of different partners, um, different laboratories process data. There's a regulatory database potentially with a, in this case, our, our partner IQVIA. Um, and then there's a mechanism for, for curating and sharing the data and publishing it, providing researcher access. Um, I'm more than happy to kind of follow up in a, in a future session if anybody wants to, to understand the, the kind of me mechanics of this. But I think collecting the data is, is becoming um, an important, important future consideration. And can we do that in a more harmonized way? And I'll touch, touch on that at the end as well. Um, so th this is really just to, to kind of give you a sense of the, the range of data. If anybody's interested in the EPAD data, it's, uh, it, it has a, a range of, of clinical um, imaging, cognition bar and, and um, spinal fluid and genotype biomarkers. So what were our strategies through EPAD? Um, 
I think I think we were we, we were very conscious in our in our data management and data sharing approach um, from the start. So you know, right from the legal agreement, the partner agreement had a two stage data release, initially private to partners, and then then ac op more open access with the researcher access process, um, kind of baked into the legal framework of the partnership. So that's an example of what I talked about earlier of opting into a set of rules and finding a, a balance between the different partner requirements. Um, there's also process elements. So we've implemented a data access request process and a decision-making framework around that, how to make sure that, that, um, that particularly when you're coming to biosamples related to the data, that there's a fair and equitable process for that. And it's also a process that, that drives the next column, which is really engagement. So you know, in, some, in some ways, I think that the philosophy is that you should, you should provide open access, really truly open access to data but that would be missing the opportunity to encourage collaboration and engagement as a scientific community. Um, while at the same time, I think that one thing I really liked about EPAD was linking data sharing with the support for early stage researchers. Um, we've been trying to, finally, we've been trying to do our bit for, for FAIR with an open data model, the use of you know, integration with the, the research digital object kind of a framework, we've published our metadata, we've encouraged data discovery through, through um, FAIR data services. Let me highlight um, something around process. So one, one of the advantages of a, of, a, of a digital research environment like ours is, is the ability to kind of have that scalability that I mentioned earlier, in particular around control services. So um, this is our kind of common denominator across lots of different um, use cases and customers where, where um, from discovering data to doing analysis and, ex and exporting um, results, um, there, there have to be a number of gateways and, and some configurability around that. And so we've, you know, through, through EPAD process, we've really learned that, that process and how to develop it. Um, I'll, I'll very, quickly touch on this, it'll be in the slides, which I'm sure we'll be sharing, but we, you know, it's been really interesting working with Neuronet to expand some of those thinking from EPAD and start to think around what are the longer term tools for data sharing and considerations um, and, and the kind of principles and drivers that, that we all find in our community. Uh, but in the interest of time, I'm going to, I'm going to gloss over this one. Um, very excited change that's happened um, recently is that uh, we're actually Last week, we soft launched the Alzheimer's Disease Data Initiative, which is a philanthropically funded um, uh, initiative to provide it global infrastructure for data sharing. And, and really, and, and I think that that experience of EPAD and working with the community, with GAIN, DPUK, CPATH, others, and hopefully soon um, other partners from Alzheimer's Europe, um, we really have, you know, starting to create infrastructure for, for doing this at a global scale. and. Um, and in, in Europe, there's a, there's a significant investment through a new IMI call, um, and it's uh, funding EPAD, on, onward EPAD data hosting and data sharing. And we've also, the IMI AMIPAD project is also being hosted on ADDI going forward. So you'll hear more about this later uh, at some point, but I, I thought it'd be useful to kind of set the scene. And what that's enabled us to do is, is to kind of take the, the FAIR aspect of EPAD from, from a website to a full service that includes data discovery, um, metadata discovery and curation, and, and, a, and, a full, and a modern data access request process that integrates with data partners. So um, going forward, next step, what are our next steps? Um, one of the things we're going to be doing is migrating and updating our data access request flow fully onto ADDI. Um, we've started looking at in the theme of broadening access, we've started dipping our toe in, our, in the water on synthetic data. So um, we've just done a short project, which will be published as now a, a virtual cohort that is, is indistinguishable, I'm told, from EPAD data. Um, and that's available for, for people to try. Um, and there'll be some work going on around um, what happens after the IMI project. As cohorts move from centralized protocols in EPAD to local solutions, what are the pressures on those data standards? That great data set we just talked about is going to suffer from a level of entropy. And could we provide tools and automation to reduce the, that, that divergence? And finally, one last point, um, 
I think I, I really need to spend some quality time with Nigel and his crew and, and see if we can um, make the EPAD data set more compatible with, with uh, the Eden approach. And uh, I think that's something we're very interested in. If we could find funding, we will definitely pursue that. So thanks very much for your time. Happy to, to kind of take questions at the end. Perfect, thank you. Uh, thanks, Rodrigo. Um, I must congratulate you both because you're keeping time very well. So um, I think we're perfectly fine in terms of um, the, the expected timelines. Um, let's move on now to Colin, Colin Veal. Um, <clears throat> and Colin uh, began his career investigating the genetic causes of complex common diseases. Uh, including psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis uh, before diversifi diversifying into the growing field of bioinformatics. And he now leads uh, the project for developing discovery technologies with Professor, uh, Professor Anthony Brooks um, at Leicester University. So Colin, now the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Carlos. Um, so I'm gonna talk about data discovery for subject recruitment within the EPAD project, the bit that we uh, part of. So, um, Hold on a second, there we go. Okay, so all scientific and medical research requires the analysis of data. Such data is either collected for the purpose of the study or it may be accessing existing resources. In fact, many data sets are collected purely for the purpose of being used by others these days. Um, in either case, this may require a discovery phase where, for example, su subjects are sourced for a clinical trial, as in the case of the EPAD project, or existing data sets are searched for appropriate data for a future study. Um, however, data discovery itself can be expensive in time, cost, and effort. For people that have data, data custodians, it's the who, what, where, and how do they share their data, which is obviously what Nigel was talking about earlier on with the regulations and things like that. Um, and obviously then there's the security, privacy, and consent issues on top of that. For researchers themselves, um, you have the speculative contact, you know, this could result in wasted time for both parties. This could be, for example, a clinical trial coordinator trying to contact many clinicians to get sufficient samples for a trial. Um, or it could be a researcher downloading a full data set from somewhere and it turned out not to be useful for what they wanted to do with it. Um, or it could be simply waiting for an access committee to meet to allow you to access data. So, um, for this, we have developed a, um, a specialized set of tools purely for data discovery. Um, so the idea of this platform is that it's based on discovery of the existence of the relevant records without revealing the actual data. The data custodian retains the full control of what aspects of the data are findable and by who. Um, the results can be returned in different ways to protect the content. So you could have yes, no's, counts, or links to contacts or the data itself, depending on what people would want to do. So this is the uh, model of the platform on the right here. I presume you can see my mouse. Um, so initially you have some data, which may be in an Excel format. It might be a text document. It could be in databases. Um, so it's, you know, it's one of the problems with data discovery and data sharing is that data is not always in an easy accessible format. Um, obviously, there's lots of initiatives to try and correct that, but um, it's not always the case, depending on time and resources. So in the model we have, we help them to transform that data into a simplified uh, model. And this model isn't built for analysis. So the idea of the model is to allow it to be found and searched very quickly. Um, on the right here, we have a module for access control. And as stated, this would allow the data controller or the data custodian to fully tune what data they have, to, they want to be made find, findable, um, who has access to that, and they retain sole control of there's no central control in our system for anybody has to control access to their data or even the findability of their data. Um, we have a set of query builders. So these are interfaces to enable simplified searching of the data. And um, we have a variety of different ones of these searching for things like phenotypes or variants or we have a module for semantic similarity searching across phenotypes using graph models in there, but they're all customizable for whatever the purpose of the study. Um, and then we have the results format, which is basically search across a network and show the results and what you may be allowed to do with those results. You know, whether you could get IDs, you would have the yes, no's or the counts or links to those data. So that's the fundamental part of the system. Um, each of these can be exist in networks. So each of these nodes 
can exist in a network and each of those can search each other. So searches can be performed from any node in the network. Um, the networks can tolerate lots of any nodes because each individual installation is independent. A node can be joined to more than one network, so therefore you can search across different networks and the data controllers can decide which data sets they make findable to each network. But just stating again, the data controllers retain full control of their data at all points. Um, so for the EPAD project, um, the, you know, one of the main aims of the EPAD project was to establish a preclinical and prodromal cohort for prevention trials. And this was to select subjects from existing cohorts based on available cognitive markers, AD risk factors and biomarkers. Um, the challenge, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> sorry, the frog in my throat. Um, so the challenge was to overcome the distributed nature of the resources, along with the many different storage formats and the time constraints of the cohort managers. And the selection criteria was that you know, the, the cohort would be linked to an EPAD trial center. There would be a consent to recontact the participants that already exist. And there would be at least a minimal data set of risk factors and or biomarkers. Um, these were assessed using the EMIF AD or the DPUK catalog. And there were 39 cohorts across Europe that filled in this uh, data questionnaire. Um, so the overall idea of the virtual registry for the recruitment would be that each cohort would provide this minimal data set uh, using a common data model and would input their data into one of these EPAD installation nodes, discovery nodes. Uh, a central EPAD search tool would be able to search across those data sets um, by the management and return sets of encrypted IDs. So these weren't the IDs that were exist for the patients normally, but they're encrypted IDs just for the purpose of the EPAD project that would allow them to recontact those cohort managers, which you could then contact the participants and recruit them into the, oops, sorry, recruit, recruit them into the longitudinal cohort study. <clears throat> so this is the um, overall design of the tool that we built for EPAD with a lot of help from everybody else in EPAD as well. And um, so the, the overall design here is if you look at the bottom here, we have the prepad pre network. So these are these individual nodes that contain the cohort data. So we have the primary cohorts, their data is transformed and stored on their own individual node that only they control. Um, we have this, what we call prepad central that has the discovery interface that can query those nodes. This was controlled by the management, which involved a, a recruitment committee and the balancing committee, of which Carlos, our host today, was a, a member of. And um, this could allow the recruitment into the LCS, which, which is what um, partly what um, uh, Rodrigo was talking about in from Iridia just now. Um, and then we also have subject monitoring and the velocity, and velocity interface, which I'll come back to in a minute. And this was all managed by an auth system that was purely built just for the EPAD project. So I'd just like to cover the uh, discovery interface and how it works with the management first. So we modified our discovery interface to be more usable for the EPAD project. So this was a simplified interface, but it was also powerful. So the idea behind it would be that you had drop downs that covered the common data model and uh, the values within it was pop populated automatically from the entire network. So that um, the data that you would query would always be um, relevant to the data that's in the network. And this would be updated live based on new nodes being added or subjects being removed or added from those nodes. Um, and also from this, um, you can't quite see it on this slide here, but you could also construct any type of and or, or logical queries on that. Once you had um, uh, developed a query, for example, here you have you know, gender is female and the MMSC lowest score is less than 29 that query would be passed across the whole network and then the results would be returned in a, a set of uh, data sets and the accounts for each of those data sets. Now, the, the good thing about this is that um, if there wasn't the right number of... Yeah. Sorry? So, um, so if there wasn't enough about a good balance between the number of subjects for recruitment or the... Um, uh, with the required characteristics, then the balance committee could adjust their query so they got the nice balance between the numbers and the required characteristics. Once they'd achieved this, then the recruitment committee could um, uh, uh, take a selection of the IDs from those results 
and then re directly request those particular subjects from the individual primary cohorts. So um, because of this, it, you know, the, the idea of having this pre pad central interface um, was, would allow the, the subject processing, which is obviously the recruitment, which is handled by IQVR and Iridia, and um, the, but also then that the, as the patients were recruited and invited into the EPAD project, this could be fed back to the individual nodes to prevent them being re-invited. And also that would also allow the uh, primary cohorts to remove subjects as necessary. So that was a dynamic uh, loop in there. Uh, but it also allowed the, the subject monitoring. So we could um, have various progress graphs, which is called CPAD, and that could show us the progress of recruitment. And this was with feedback from Iridia um, so that we could see when people were recruited uh, after they've been invited to using this process. Um, we could do that on a per, per batch basis or via the actual cohorts. And we could also look at the time to recruitment on an individual basis there. Um, so this, the, the, the idea of these tools would allow us to see any bottlenecks in the process, because obviously this is all a learning curve for all of us in the project. And it came to light that really there was um, a limited uh, number of, um, a subset of subjects that were very time critical to recruit for these, um, for this prevention type of trials. And um, so we developed the velocity interface where the management could um, set a, a criteria of subjects that were very important for the subject, for the study, and the primary cohorts would have access to that criteria. And if they had any patients arriving that would be really suitable for that, then they could basically insert them through the velocity interface directly into the re recruitment process. And also because it's part of this prepad central, if there was any overlap between the subjects being in the nodes themselves, then they would also be then excluded from any discovery from the other process. So they wouldn't be like sort of being asked again and again. So overall, the, um, there was 14 cohorts that were connected to the um, registry, and this totaled about 35,000 participants. 21,000 of those met the minimum requirements, and 4,000 of them were invited to the LCS. And these were distributed all over Europe. So it's a, a pan-European recruitment process. Um, it seemed to be a very feasible way of recruiting. And the, I think one of the important things that we had from this was that because we could have these installations that were controlled by the individual cohorts, that we were sensitive to their local context and we were flexible to be able to accommodate their needs for transforming the data or, or how they wanted the data to be seen. So obviously we could set um, uh, minimum numbers so that it couldn't be any re-identification attacks because we could make sure that the, the results would only be shown beyond a certain number of uh, uh, subjects each time. So um, I'll, I'll leave with that because uh, I think I'm probably up to time. And I'd just like to thank everybody that is part of the EPAD because it's a huge project and it's very enjoyable to be part of. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. <clears throat> Excellent. So we've, we've seen um, in these last two presentations two specific tools that have been implemented successfully in the context of, of projects. Um, so part of the uh, role of Neuronet is actually um, leverage, those, um, to leverage those results from the different projects and also look for synergies across the different IMI projects in the new regeneration space. Um, so I think uh, in that respect, the last presentation is gonna be enlightening um, and I'm happy to introduce Manuela Rinaldi. Um, so she's the project manager at Modis Life Sciences in, in Belgium and provides project management support to, to Janssen in the Neuronet project. Uh, Janssen obviously is the, is the project leader, so my co-leads, uh, I think Leonard is in the audience, so he's my co-lead in Neuronet. Um, so Manuela, can you, uh, Manuela will explain the lessons learned and what we're doing in terms of um, the data sharing working group, uh, trying to promote the um, exchange of best practices, etc. So Manuela, off you go. Thank you, uh, Carlos. I'm still on mute. Um, so yeah, I would like to thank then uh, Alzheimer Europe uh, and as well Neuronet for giving me the opportunity to present today. Um, so as uh, Carlos mentioned, so I will provide a short update around the working group data sharing and reuse that we have uh, within Neuronet. Uh, on the next slide, you can find um, an overview of the presentation of today. Uh, so first, I will uh, briefly um, explain uh, the Neur Neuronet projects. I will also provide more information around the neurodegenerative disease portfolio, which is part of Neuronet. I will then also explain shortly the working groups um, and go into more detail in the working group data sharing and reuse. And finally, I would like to end my presentation with a conclusion. 
So on the next slide, um, so you can see, um, so uh, you have an overview of when Neuronet uh, started. And so Neuronet is an IMI2 project. Um, so for the ones that are not familiar with IMI, so I know IMI is Innovative Medicines Initiative. And it's a joint undertaking between um, um, FPA and the European Union. Um, so FPA stands for European Federation mm -hmm. of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations. Um, so the project started um, last year in March. Um, so we are already halfway through the project and it will end uh, by the end of uh, February, 2022. Um, you can see that actually it's a very small consortium. Um, we are only with nine beneficiaries that are involved in this project. Um, and Synapse is a project coordinator of Neuronet uh, while Janse is the project leader. So both Carlos uh, Diaz and uh, Lennart Stukers are leading uh, the Neuronet project. Um, so besides um, Synapse and Janssen, we also have obviously um, some other uh, partners involved uh, like NICE, um, Alzheimer Europe is as well a beneficiary, Parkinson's UK, and from industry you also have Sanofi, Roche, Takeda and Lili. So on the next slide, I'll just briefly explain what is actually the aim of Neuronet. Um, so within Neuronet, we really want to set up an efficient platform to boost synergy and a collaboration across IMI projects of the neurodegenerative disorders portfolio. So we already um, tried to already set up a knowledge based platform in which we identified, um, let's say, all the important project assets of the several IMI projects, um, as well as the deliverables, publications, etc. Um, besides that, we also want to really assist in identifying the gaps, um, multiplying its impact, enhancing its visibility and facilitating dovetailing with related initiatives in Europe, uh, but also worldwide. So the next slide is just to give you an overview of all the different IMI projects that are currently um, part of uh, Neuronet. Um, obviously, I will not go into detail today, uh, but just to highlight that we have already 18 IMI uh, ND uh, uh, projects that are part of Neuronet. Um, and we might also think uh, not to only uh, focus only on neurodegenerative disease portfolio, but also to expand um, to other IMI projects. The next slide just uh, gives you an overview of uh, the neural networking groups that we have. Um, and I will mainly focus on the first work working group, which is around data sharing and reuse. We also have a working group uh, which is focused on health technology assessment and regulatory interactions. So for that, there is a session tomorrow, I think, at the Alzheimer Europe conference. And we also have a session later today um, around working group three, which is focused on uh, patient privacy and ethics. Um, and besides that, Neuronet has also a fourth working group which is focused on uh, sustainability. So our main presentation today is really focused on the first working group um, and which is focusing on data sharing and what do we exactly mean with data sharing. It's really the practice of making research data available to um, the research community or to other investigators. And with that, so the purpose really of the working group is to um, share lessons learned around data sharing, uh, to discuss common challenges and needs. Um, to identify priorities and opportunities for synergy and collaboration across projects. And by that, we hope that um, the results will lead to more consistent and informed decision making. Um, it will lead to improved reuse of results, enhance uh, networking across projects, um, exposure uh, to expert knowledge, and also have a homogeneous application of standards. Um, so the next slide just gives an overview on how we uh, started um, this uh, working group. So uh, the first step was to identify the experts of several IMI projects that could share their knowledge in our neural networking group. So once we had, had identified the experts, we then together uh, defined the scope of this working group, um, really focused on data sharing issues, but as well uh, focusing on learnings around data standardization and harmonization. And in the end, um, by uh, really further explore these um, topics, we really hope to consoli consolidate some learnings into recommendations and also publish uh, some white papers and also have a final version of our uh, deliverable, which is focused on guidance tools on data sample sharing and use. So the next slide just provides an overview of all the experts that are um, members of the neural networking group. So you can see that we have like 13 experts um, um, that are making part of this working group and as well as some few speakers like Rodrigo and Nigel, which, uh, which are uh, also making part of this uh, working group. 
Um, we also have some members of Neuronet, um, obviously, which are also contributing to the working group. Um, and also maybe uh, something to mention is that, uh, so Jan Janse Lennart is also leading uh, this working group data sharing and reuse. So the next slide just provides an overview of all the different topics that we discuss within our working group and that we really would like to further focus on. And this just gives an overview of several topics that were identified um, regarding data sharing issues. So you can have some legal um, hurdles and there can be some, or some organizational or technical aspects that should be considered as well, some ethical considerations. Um, you can have some data protection regulations as well, which you need to um, take into account. There can be some psychological or social impacts, um, some political issues. Um, there can be a lack of metadata, which also makes then data sharing quite difficult. And you also have some subjective data um, that you also should see on how to deal with that. So in the next slide, I will just briefly explain more the, the data sharing topics we identified and just try to provide some examples or uh, mention the focus of uh, our working group. Um, so for the first um, issue that we encountered, so the legal hurdles, so you can have a lot of legal hur hurdles if you want to share data between two IMI projects. Um, for instance, then if you want to really share data, you really need to formalize a collaboration agreement, uh, which can be very time consuming. Um, so therefore, in our working group, we really want to provide some templates of uh, existing collaboration agreements uh, to really uh, enhance uh, these uh, collaboration agreements uh, for future IMI projects. Um, besides that, there are also some ethical um, aspects that should be considered um, if you uh, regarding uh, data sharing. Um, you have some GDPR um, rules you also need to adhere to. Um, so within this working group, we also therefore want to capture the learnings of data protection issues and GDPR um, by approaching another IMI project, uh, Big Data at Heart, but also by liaising with the Neuronet Ethics Working Group, uh, which is uh, fully um, working this topic uh, further out. Um, on the next slide, we will also focus in our working group on some organizational and technical aspects. So in this working group, we will, will evaluate in several IMI projects, which information government, governance models were chosen by the data owners, and we will also provide possible solutions for future projects. For the technical aspects, we will develop some recommendations or decision trees um, regarding the type of infrastructures that can be used for data sharing. Um, so therefore, we will um, therefore use the lessons learned from IMI projects uh, that um, have some input on two basic models, um, either centralized databasing or uh, federated data access. On the next slide, we will also evaluate whether data in several IMI projects are really adhering to the FAIR principle, uh, which was already briefly explained uh, previously um, the previous presentations. Um, FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, for that, we will then also uh, liaise with the IMI project FAIR Plus, um, which is really uh, the goal to evaluate if data are really there according to FAIR principles. Also something that was uh, mentioned previously is that, of course, if you want to share data, um, we can also have a psychological or social um, impact. Um, so this means that trust is also really important if you want to uh, facilitate um, data sharing. Um, so we want to also with the working, working group also provide some learnings on this aspect. Um, and for that, we will use examples of um, other IMI projects, like for instance, Eden, they have worked out um, a research quid pro quo for sustainability from framework based on trust and relevance. Um, besides that, another topic which we will consider is the lack of metadata. So we really want to identify all existing data that may have resulted um, or, av or available from IMI projects. Um, for that, we will then evaluate some uh, cataloging initiatives within uh, some projects like EMIF and Roadmap. And also something that, that we will consider is the fact on uh, how to deal with subjective data um, because patient reported outcomes are uh, becoming extreme, extreme, increasingly important. Um, so a lot of smart devices are as well used, um, let's say to monitor the daily activities of uh, certain patients. Um, so for that, we will also um, capture the lessons learned from uh, two IMI projects. Um, so we besides um, some data sharing issues, we will also focus on uh, data harmonization and data standardization and provide there some learnings. Um, so um, we will there uh, provide learnings based on um, 
experience of uh, IMI projects. So, um, for instance, we will provide learnings about the use of a common data model to support harmonization and interoperability, and also provide uh, some examples of how other IMI projects uh, mapped their data. So with that, um, by really gathering all this information around data sharing issues, um, as well as some learnings around data harmonization and standardization, we would like to then consolidate all these learnings into recommendations. And this will hopefully lead to white papers and as well uh, to a final version of our deliver deliverable. Um, and obviously we hope by um, providing all these results that it will not only be of high value to the IMI and D portfolio, but also to other IMI projects or other um, initiatives. And for that, um, that's it. So that's the final uh, presentation. So I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, thank you. Thank you, Manuela. Okay, so um, I think we probably, um, as you've seen, we touch on all of the uh, critical aspects uh, pertaining to, to data sharing. Um, in, you know, one of the presentations, um, some of the aspects were actually highlighted in, in several of the, of the presentations. So I don't know if there's any questions from the audience at this point. Um, I don't think so um, for now. So um, I, I do have one question um, and it is a very simple one, um, perhaps to the whole, to the whole panel now. Um, what's going on guys? Uh, you know, um, we've been discussing data sharing for decades. Um, up to now, um, we're still struggling with, with this, yeah? Um, we're devising smart solutions on the technical front, uh, infrastructure. Um, obviously, people, not only people living with dementia, but also uh, people in general, are um, generously donating uh, data continuously. Um, I guess that assuming that those data will be used uh, not only for clinical care, but also for research. Uh, so what, what are the obstacles? Why, why is this happening? Uh, do you think that, that in some sense, the bottlenecks are not informed consent forms or anything like that, but are rather a one level up, if you, if you like, you know, uh, um, the, the incentives have to be worked out with people actually um, custodians of the data rather than the, than the owners of the data themselves. So who wants to speak first? Nigel, perhaps you? Yeah, I mean, if I may, thank you, Carlos. I mean, it's a good question. I mean, actually recently also in other meetings and some podcasts I've done, I've posed the question, if you take yourself back to 2010 and you're looking forward to 2020 and we have all our hopes, dreams and aspirations for all our strategies, many of us, we had the Anson 2020, you know, numerous organisations had strategies. It would be interesting to look back now and think, compared to the aspirations a decade ago, how far have we come? And we've definitely made progress. I think there's no doubt about it. Is it as far as we would like in many areas? Well, clearly not, you know, and then actually still the aspirations and dreams, and certainly as mentioned by, by Colin and, and, and Rodrigo and Manuela in, in, this, uh, in this presentation point to that, I think that there's still more work to be done. And again, it's a socio-technical construct. I think technologically, we are far more advanced, uh, both from a tooling and methodological point of view and, and so forth. Governance remains a challenge, uh, of course, not so much because we are, um, you know, you know, anti GDPR or anything like that, but the, the, the interpretation layer of these kind of guidelines has been you know, poor, let's put it that way, and therefore the implementation layer has been difficult. And also, I think, and as I've said many times in different fora, um, I don't think society clearly understands still the balance between focus on risk versus the absolute benefits that we can see by doing all of this. And of course, this year has accelerated that again, as of course, we're talking about COVID-19. Um, and also, you know, a lot of people, whether it's at a policy level, public, um, in, in, in institutions, you know, many people have realized we are, have a really significant frailty here in our systems. And more importantly, and I think this is the theme for 21st century, and then I'll shut up, we ought to need to collaborate. You know, nobody can really do it on their own anymore. This is just too big, whether it's neurodegenerative diseases or in any disease area, or just, you know, just broadly speaking. So I think it's taken quite some people, some time for people, maybe a new generation of researchers and academic clinicians and policymakers and industry and everyone to kind of wise up to this. But uh, let's let's see what happens in the next decade then from 2020 to 2030. <laughs> Renew expectations, right? Uh, so Rodrigo, what do you think? I, I'd agree with 
with everything Nigel said. I, I guess we're looking at what things allow things allow data sharing to scale. I, I think incentives are, are definitely part of it, but how can you design incentives that also scale so so that it's 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 self-service or it's done for me? Or I don't have to spend lots of time thinking about the legal aspect. If you look at something like the Creative Commons approach to, to sharing kind of creative content, we kind of need something like that. Something nice. We spend a lot of time just clarifying the you know the, the the governance documentation, clarifying the incentives. If that was could be done and distributed as, as an effort, then maybe maybe there'd be less less barriers. You know, it's just too much like hard work to share the data, you know. <laughs> Um, so I'm being a little bit flippant, but but you, hopefully people will recognize that you know that that is a barrier. Um, yeah. Do you, do you guys think that? Um, and, and Colin, please uh, chip in. Or Manuela, chip in as needed. Uh, do you guys think that the people are using sometimes GDPR, ethics, um, uh, you know, all of the legalese, etc., as an excuse? But actually, you know, it's more of of an institutional bottleneck. You know, in terms of how the scientific system works, because. Science works, uh, you know, by trying to motivate researchers, and, and researchers are competing amongst themselves. So in that sense, data becomes an asset. Um, so I, I feel sometimes, you know, these regulations, rules and regulations, are more than anything an excuse. Um, I don't know, yes. I, Nietzsche, I see you nodding. So yeah, well, I'm bound to nod to that. You know that already, Carlos. But, <laughs> but um, no, I mean, I think sadly, I think that's true. I think that's all intertwined again with comments both Rodrigo and I made just a moment ago and I think um, you know where does one start one could get quite quite negative and almost nihilistic about it there are multiple problems in the system whether it's uh, scientific competitiveness as you say you know originally everyone competes for grants and you know this is how we further our science and so on the publications arena you know, we all see this now you know it's, it's not fit for purpose uh, peer review is, is, is somewhat damaged um, and actually, it should not take a considerable amount of time to publish results that could impact on our understanding of all sorts of aspects of, in this case, neurodegenerative diseases, uh, that, you know, the biology right through to their treatment and outcomes. So, so a lot of things are in the 21st century are clearly still 20th century at best. And, and, you know, we have to address that, I think, again, as part of this rather healthy, robust debate in terms of what do we need to change. Um, and I think there are initiatives like we are discussing now this afternoon and wider that are addressing that but uh, but it's you know this incremental it takes time yeah. and if we really want to see 21st century research or 21st century tools and the kind of speed but not lack of quality and so forth then this has to be a local level and at a policy level both working together to to address this and and being a bit disruptive as well i think uh, yeah. To, uh, yeah. Like, I mean, people, people are, are sharing all the time. So, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, who wants to chip in? I, I was just going to say that um, from um, um, an academic perspective, it's um, it's interesting what Nigel said before about the perception of risk versus benefits, because a lot of the data sharing aspects now, it's all about risk. And the, uh, from the university, they're worried about, you know, being fine for GDPR. And <laughs> people are worried about data being shared because of things like Facebook. And um, very little is said about what's the actual benefit of sharing, particularly health data and you know things like that. And of course, there's huge benefits. And if you speak to a lot of the, the, the subjects, I remember when I, when I used to work in psoriasis and other diseases that the subjects want their data shared. They want it out there to be used and you know, a benefit to them. Um, particularly, I mean, I, I remember working on one disease that was, was quite nasty called primary pulmonary hypertension. And you know, this this quite a severe disease for women when they're pregnant, they get um, hypertension in their lungs, which results in death in quite a short time. And you know, the critical area there is they wanted things to be researched quickly. And you know, the fear that seems to be generated from the risks, as Nigel says, it seems to be putting a lot of, of the universities off wanting to host data or to make it available. They want to put it behind bars, basically. And that just makes it very difficult for this sort of collaborations to form, you know. Do you guys think that you, you, a couple of you have mentioned in your presentations, of course, patient reported outcomes, and the, and we know we all know this is coming, um, big time. So, so do you think that the the um, a, a more direct channel, say, between uh, the the ultimate owner of the data, uh, that is ourselves, and you know, platforms and systems for data sharing will change a little bit the paradigm, or do you guys think there's still going to be middlemen, you know, that always mediate? 
access to the data. Rodrigo. Okay. Maybe, yeah, so I think this is tying into the previous conversations around, you know, why we invest and, and work with the trusted research environment model and the safe haven model is for two things. One is to kind of raise the bar. Like, so, so security and risk is a kind of an inflationary pro process. It's, it's very easy to add requirements. And, and that's why companies like ours exist because it's a specialist subject after a while. And, and, and uh, but, but the other side is, is the possibility of tying it into real world clinical act outcomes and, and I think just releasing data is a kind of an a, a this it's like a dissipating effect whereas engagement like like I mentioned earlier with the EPAD researcher access process or tying into real clinical systems and the feedback loops needed for those to be driven by machine learning that can that 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 also ties into that trusted research environment model and I guess that's why we're we're kind of putting effort into that area um, but I, I mean I go back to your original question I, I don't think I think it's more on a lack, lack of education than, than a kind of a barrier, like a, like a smoke screen around GDPR and things. I think people just, it's a complicated subject. I think the more we can do to, to, to kind of not dumb it down, but streamline the, the, the key points around balancing privacy and utility for research and, and patients, I think that's the, the key thing. And um, I, I don't know anybody, I think it's really just people are trying to do their job to as custodians of data, but it's a complicated subject. I mean, you know, it's it's a 150 page questionnaire from a compliance <laughs> team to, you know, it's like I have to do 10 of those this week, you know, so that that's just hard work and a specialist subject. And I think a lot of smaller clinical centers just just don't have the time, resource, or specialty to, to do that, really. If so. I may uh, paraphrase Monty Python, no one expects the DPIA, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, <laughs> I can resist. Yeah. Sorry, but I think I think I may be controversial here, but I'll say this: um, that mm -hmm. one of the things you instantly both, both were kind of purporting to in, in your comments was, you know, who owns the data? This whole thing about ownership, mm -hmm. and you know, it's all our data. I don't believe it is. Um, you know, there's a lot of rhetoric that we all own the data as citizens and patients, but there's data we generate, which is you know our own. You can argue. But much of the data we're talking about that's been used traditionally today is about us, generated by others. You know, your, your physician, your nurse, your therapist, you know, whoever in an institution where the data has been housed for a long period of time, decades and decades in paper, then electronically and so forth. And we had similar problems with paper we do electronically, it's not sometimes worse, but everyone seems to go crazy over the digital side. But even so, you know, it's 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 someone else's, and I think uh, Rodrigo, you're absolutely right. It's that responsibility that people have, which is almost like a corporate responsibility in a hospital environment, for instance, or or Colin, an academic environment, where you are a curator and you're responsible for the sanctity and security of that data, which is about other people, um, but it's actually not owned by them. It doesn't sit in some database that they actually ultimately have control over, and and they don't. You know, we don't generally are, are not in a not in a position to say, well, you can see this data and you mm. can't. That's what people so, talk about. Yeah. Most of the systems aren't there in place at a society level. It's still rhetoric, I think. So this is why GDPR is a really is really helpful because it does clarify some of the languages. You know, it allows me as a company to say we're a data processor only. We're not a Facebook with a two-sided business model. You know, it allows a, a, a data custodian to say our job is to to manage data about other people, and we have certain rights and responsibilities to preserve there. Um, I think I think that that could be kind of evolved into some really clear messaging for people. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah. And um, let me let me stick with you, Rodrigo. So you mentioned mm -hmm. this new initiative, ADDI. Yeah. Um, so you know, I mean, we've seen a number of initiatives. You can imagine, you know, over the years, uh, being mm -hmm. born and then sometimes, well, most of the time, perhaps dying after a few years. What do you feel is different about this one that can really represent um, a step forward? Yeah, I was worried you, given the way you started, I was worried you were going to ask me that question. <laughs> the, the, best, the best way I can answer it is, so, so ADDI is, is, a, is a consortium of philanthropic and academic funders like, um, like the, the Alzheimer's Association, the MRC, the Wellcome Trust, I think, has, involved, has been involved, in, and, and kind of private philanthropy like uh, Gates, ventures and I think possibly even the Bezos Foundation I think were kind of involved um, and and I suppose what what that's t telling us is that two things one is that the recognition that science, funders of science 
have been happy to invest in platforms for the last number of years, but that has been funding innovation. And now they're saying, okay, now we need to scale this out to the 90%. And I think you will see, you will see an effort to consolidate existing, that innovation that was great from the likes of, I know I'll pick on EMIF because Nigel's in the room, you know, <laughs> that, how can we turn that innovation and turn it into a scalable future plan? Um, that, that can meet the needs, not just of the 10% who know how to build and innovate. So that's one thing. And the second thing, it's a recognition that, that maybe as funders, they should be providing a bit like the changes in the publication model from, you know, that, that maybe that's the, the long-term data management needs to be paid for. Mm-hmm. And I think they're looking at it as a, an, as a longer, you know, longer-term funding for some of these initiatives, um, for, for storing data, for making access to data, um, and the use of data and collaboration, something that you know will be there in five, ten years time at least, you know, and 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 I guess the th- maybe a third thing is it's telling that this is not something that's being funded by governments. I mean, from a European perspective, that's that's maybe the first port of call you would be thinking about. Um, but 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 yeah, so there's a gap. There's a gap in long term, pla- you know, long term platforms for data sharing and 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 collaboration. And, and I guess they're trying to they're trying to meet that gap. Whether they'll be any more successful than than others, I I guess it's up to us to to kind of influence it. So one of the things we're trying to do is 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 learn the lessons of open standards and and and, and drive that kind of federated model that Colin mentioned, um, and and just just pick those standards and go with them. You know, so th- those are maybe some of the strategies that will make a difference this time around. We have high hopes. So. Uh... Yeah, you have now to fulfill. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think Europe is in a good place. I mean, as Alzheimer's Europe is going to be particularly of interest, I think we have the opportunity. So ADDI is going to be a global thing. Um, but so next week, we're talking to the, the Indian um, scientific community, for example, um, about setting up a node in, in, in there. But, but I think, you know, Europe has a density to it um, through the IMI. That, that we should really be getting our house in order on. And I think hopefully we'll be great partners in this ADDI. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that. Uh, of course, I mean, I think Nigel, you, you mentioned that as well. We we're facing grand challenges here. So, yeah. uh, you know, systemic challenges. So probably you need systemic solutions as well. Uh, I mean, the model by yeah. which one institution or a group of institutions just develop their own little model, their own little tool, etc., <clears throat> doesn't work anymore. You know, I, mean, I mean, we've tried that uh, repeatedly, say, uh, I think we need a different approach, uh, uh, a global approach in which um, I think, Nancy, again, you, you, you said it, uh, collaboration is key, um, open, frank, no strings attached collaboration. I, I, I don't think that we can solve these challenges without that, to be honest. Um, so, so Colin, from your perspective, um, you know, you, you guys have been struggling to advocate about um, data discovery uh, for, for many years, I think. Uh, do you see a change in the tide in, in terms of people more willing or easier ways to actually enable that, that data discovery, at least as a first phase towards data sharing? Uh, yeah, I think so, because, I mean, I suppose really when I, I joined with Tony um, a, a while, you know, more than 10 years ago, nobody really spoke about data discovery, whereas when you go to a lot of meetings now, discovery of data is, is you know, mentioned a lot more often and how do you find the data to share it and etc and all these issues around it so I think there has been a, a big change and um, it sort of depends on the type of project so obviously I think you probably know that Tony's involved in the rare disease projects at the moment and of course the key thing there is that often they don't have enough patients to um, you know to make a cohort to find the mutations present in those in those rare diseases and they're very keen to obviously, like you said, the data ownership, they don't actually want to give the data away, but they want to be able to form collaborations. So they want to be able to find what other people have. And so this like, idea of data discovery without revealing the data is, is quite key, keen for them because it's, you know, I can find a similar patient in a different rare disease network that may have the same mutation. So I think it, the, the understanding of that is becoming much more popular and understood that you're not going to lose. I think that's the other thing, like I was just saying, you know, they don't want to lose ownership of the data. They don't want to lose their intellectual property, so to speak, um, but they want to collaborate and it's forming the collaborations that's important. You know, if you can get people to form collaborations, then science will progress. Fantastic. I think, I I think actually what, sorry, sorry, what, what Nigel was saying earlier about these common data models as well, because it, 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 I just said about um, data on paper 
and um, obviously stored in different formats. You know, if you have a common data model, it makes it much more easy to discover data because you don't have these common data models or the, um, the open standards like Rodrigo was mentioning, you can't, it makes it very hard to discover data. Sorry, I think that's, uh, yeah, that's kind of what I was going to pick up. And I, I think th this is my lesson from the last few years is, is it's all very well to have our, 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 our great little systems, our big systems, but what we have to do is all grow up and adopt these open standards so that the networks we create are not monolithic, vertically integrated things. You know, so this is a bit of a technical point, but basically the more you can en encourage someone to invest in sharing in a way that allows them to create new networks as their needs evolve, the better. So it's all very well, we could provide the best hermetically sealed network, but if that doesn't help you move on to the next, next network. So I, we work with hospitals, they're interested in the Alzheimer's network or the cancer network or the, you know, each of, they can't be spending their time investing in lots of different protocols and approaches. So part of the growing up for us as a community is, is finding those standards like the Global Alliance has done for example, for our community. So. If I may just quickly add, I think one of the things we definitely need to watch uh, with interest, and I hope uh, with pos some positivity, is the European Health Data Space, the HDS development. I know um, for mm. UK um, participants that this might be difficult, but um, there's certainly um, the HDS and the open cloud uh, initiatives, you know, various things that are being created now or being developed within Europe are going to be extremely interesting. I think, I think policymakers have woken up to this too. They clearly see we need to collaborate. Data is a supremely important asset. And I agree, agree with you both, Colin and, and Rodrigo. It isn't about ownership at all. It's just the ability to be able to interrogate this data wherever it may sit with a high degree of confidence to enable us to generate the evidence, the insights that we require to answer whatever questions are most appropriate. Um, and this can be truly global. There is not, I don't, you know, te the technology exists. It's not a technical issue as such, I'm not decrying the challenges, but, you know, actually it's about commitment and will to do it. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah and, and well, of course, you know, and this is uh, perhaps the final point because um, I think that, that we have to finish <laughs> now. <laughs> But I think that also, I mean, of course, the, the introduction of new disease modifying treatments for Alzheimer's, for example, after many decades of failures, this will also, this may also incentivize, you know, uh, quantum leap, say, in terms of data collection and data standardization and, and data utilization, uh, not least because we will have to see the um, treatment effects, yeah, and, and, and related with that, of course, considerations about value of the different treatments, et cetera. So I think that we may be well facing uh, a, new, a new era in terms of data sharing. Let's hope so. Um, but with that, I want to thank all speakers. I want to thank um, Alzheimer's Europe, of course, for organizing um, this parallel session and all attendants. Um, I think it's been very interesting. So uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Mr. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye all. Thank you all. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Bye bye. 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 bye.